thank you again. Welcome back. Uh, maybe what we do is is is, uh, is talk about um, um, have a little discussion as well. Um, so uh, while I teach, I also do, and I also appreciate the fact that when I'm teaching, I can say do this, this, and this, or you know do these three things. But then you get to the real world, and <laughs> they don't work. Uh, people don't call you back. You're on a deadline. And the other issue too is sometimes people will talk to you, but they just you haven't given them enough time. They're not available. They're out of the country. Um, I think too, as journalists, you've you've learned the importance of de developing sources, uh, protecting your sources. We'll talk a bit about that, about and and being uh, reliable. Um, but I really think if you become, if you can develop a relationship or um, um, uh, a uh, reputation as being a, a, a journalist of integrity, then people will come to you with the stories and people will be willing to talk to you. And the other thing you have to remember, and I know you do about politics, uh, there's always lots of people that are willing to give you the dirty scoop on the, on the government because they're on the other side because they, they want the power, right? So you've got the people in power and they say, well, we're not gonna talk to you. But there's a whole bunch of people over here who might have some of that information or at least hear things, right? And you might be able to get verified information from uh, an anonymous source, which we'll talk about. So um, let me actually just move to uh, where my slide deck is here. Um, but yeah, uh, some really, really excellent questions, right? And, and part of this too goes to the Dan Rather uh, clip there about objectivity is it possible to be 100 percent objective now if you think that the government should um negotiate with exxon um see as journalists we have uh we are given a uh, it's a privilege i think it's it's a um um it's uh it's 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 not a right it's it's um we're not we don't like we're given a place to speak we're given the podium and with that comes responsibility. And it's, it's about having balance. Like the idea of taking uh, like one quote from somebody and then taking their picture offline. By the way, uh, excuse me, Google Images, uh, like as one who puts photos up, I still own the rights to those pictures. So um, there's another th way that you can guard your integrity as a journalist is make sure that the images that you use, you have the rights to use them. You're not just taking a picture off of Google images. And, and by the way, that's, that's, we've had that problem in Canada. Uh, one of our, uh, my former students uh, had a, had a picture. I don't know. We were, he was watching global, some global TV show. It was just a TV channel. And in the background, his photo came up, they'd pulled it off the internet. Right. And so then one of my colleagues reached out to the, to the TV station and say, uh, are you gonna pay this kid for that photo? You can't just take pictures and use them. They do belong to somebody. Uh, so just make sure that you watch your, um, uh, your integrity on that level as well. And, and same with, um, uh, with, with photos or other things. Um, and if they're supplied, photo credits are very helpful too. So people know where it comes from. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about interviews and this maybe relates uh, because if you can't get somebody, then not having an interview is a problem. I've always enjoyed interviewing. I, I love talking to people and I love how it fills in the story. So um, I don't know where or how you grew up, but I, I had coloring books as a kid. That was one of the things we had. And um, you know, you take your colored crayons or pen we have crayons, but you'd color them in. And at the end you'd get this beautiful colored picture. And a new story is like that. You want to try to color in all of the all of the different areas of the story, and interviews are a real big part of it because the it it puts someone else's voice into the story. So, if I believe that the government uh, uh, should negotiate with the oil company, that or renegotiate, then you can do a story about that for sure. But I think you need to have both sides of it, right? Side one says, yes, we should. Side two says this. And then you're just presenting like without, without a voice. Like here's side one, here's side two. And let people decide for themselves. The other thing is, <clears throat> I think people will have a stronger response if they come to the decision themselves, whether uh, or versus me telling them um, what to believe, right? Say, well, here, this is what you believe. Because people take the underdog side. I don't know if you ever watched something um, 
a show where um, even of the villain, right? Like you start to feel sorry for the bad person because um, <clears throat> I don't know, they're getting picked on or there's an imbalance somehow. People really, like it's the David and Goliath, if you know who they are, uh, the idea <clears throat> that you have a giant and then you have this little shepherd boy, basically. Uh, and people root for the, always they root for the underdog. And, and the other thing is sometimes you get the opposite effect from activist journalism. People say, well, you're just attacking the government. That's not really fair, right? Um, and um, let me tell you a personal story that happened this week. So at my university, we have a statue of Egerton Ryerson, right? And it, I went to that university as an undergrad years ago, and I walked by it many times. And it's a just a statue of him. And again, he was the creator of the public school system in Ontario. A uh, lot of outrage towards him. And there was lots of discussion of removing the statue, uh, which I agreed with. I think, I think you should take the statue down. I think if, you know, if he, if he, prom if he promoted something that was, I mean, I don't, I never studied the person. It didn't matter to me. Uh, I, the name, I mean, I paid no attention to it because I went there for TV course and, and, and journalism, not to, uh, to some statue. Um, but anyways, uh, as I heard about more about them, I said, yeah, they should take it down. So they were in the process of working they had a committee um, and they were looking to get rid of the statue. Well, this last week, there was a big protest on Sunday and the crowd pulled the statue down and then they smashed the head of the statue off with a um, with sledgehammers and then they threw the head in the lake, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, while I think the statue should have been removed, to do it like that seemed not right to me because the people that were working towards, uh, it, it just seemed, well, it was violent and it, um, it seemed, I don't know, it didn't leave a good feeling in my, and the police did nothing, right? They just let it happen, this, this act of vandalism and, and whatnot. And, it, you know, I think if you live in a democracy where you, you, you know, you, you just have to be careful what you say and how you live and that's fine. But do we live in a world where you can just go and pull stuff down? I, I don't think we do. Um, but it, 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 again, I still think the statue should have been taken down, but I don't think it was done the right way. That's what I'm trying to say. And in the same way, if you think that, uh, that uh, Ghana should renegotiate with Exxon, okay, that's fine. Well, what's the right way of telling that story, right? Um, <clears throat> maybe do a series, you know, uh, why do they think that is? And then you do a series like it affects, uh, maybe there's, uh, there's villages that, that could do better. And this village is affected because the negotiations left them out of the negotiations or whatever. Like if you tell your story through people, people can make their own conclusion, right? <clears throat> Here's what this, this is, this is how this contract, the current contract is not, is not good for the country uh, or good for these people. Um, and who you choose to interview is a significant part of telling the story, right? Because on one side, if I, uh, public relations people generally are happy to talk to you, but you have to remember too, they have media training and they are um, at a place where they, um, they're paid to talk to, 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 the, to journalists. They're paid to put out fires and they speak a certain way. <clears throat> so if you have a, a PR person and then just a, maybe someone who's, just a, some, I don't know, pick somebody. Uh, they fish for a living, let's say, right? Um, and you have the other side of that and they don't sound very, you know, very professional or they stutter. Uh, they're not professional speakers. Um, even that sometimes works in your favor. You have sort of this stuttering under, underdog and this slick public relations person. Uh, people will, you know, people root for the underdog. I, I think that's the case. I mean, I don't know about the movies and TV shows you watch, but I'm like, the underdog yeah you know like yeah i don't know the team that uh pick a sports team that that nobody expected to win and then suddenly they're doing really well people want them yeah go right um and so uh but who you select for your interviews will bias your story one way or the other and what the interviews gives you remember too they're not giving you fact don't ever take like if i say there's seven days in a week okay double fact check everything right um, or you might have an expert that's, uh, that you interview, but that doesn't mean they're right. So let's say you interview an expert on something, always double check the facts of what they say in case it's not right. Or they, they, they have remembered something incorrectly, right? Uh, you want to be fair. 
Uh, and the other thing too, to the point about activist journalism, the problem is, uh, can you be fair if you've taken a side, right? Can I be fair to the government? Like, like the other problem is um, you don't know how they came up with that decision, probably because you weren't in the room. So why did they sign the contract that they did? I don't know, right? Uh, maybe it was the best they could get. Maybe there was, you know, you don't know all of the details. And um, I would think personally, once you've signed a contract, uh, I think it would be really hard to negotiate or renegotiate a contract, uh, especially with big oil, right? I would think they have big lawyers and, and uh, it's probably pretty solid when you have somebody sign on the dotted line, right? Um, also, I just want to talk as just a little bit. This somebody was saying about uh, the question about do I put a uh, one picture up and then um, make it look like that's the story? Uh, when you're doing a video story, I don't know if any of you do video. Um, you want to make sure there's something we call cross scripting. This is one of the biggest problems that I see in journalism. Uh, this is a pen. This is a pencil, and this is a TV remote. Okay. So when I talk about something, if I talk about this great remote that I got with my TV, you want to see it. Say remote, see remote, right? I got this remote for my TV. I also got this great pencil from Disneyland Paris and, or, or this pen from Disneyland Paris. And I got this pencil from my, from my closet, right? So pencil, pen, remote, right? Say it, see it. Uh, the problem is sometimes people cross script so they're talking about their pencil and they're showing me a pen. I got this new pencil from uh, my closet. Uh, this remote control works great with my television and this pen is excellent. Got it in Disneyland, right? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't sync up. So when you're doing video content, make sure what you show is what you're talking about, right? Say it, see it, say it, see it. Make sure it's all synced up or it's called cross scripting. Um, because that can confuse the audience with your story and it can also bias your story, right? With the pictures that you use or even the lighting. Now the lighting today is not bad. So I've got a very soft light here. Which camera have I got here? What you cannot see behind me is right there. That is a $5,000 video light, the black bar. This is a $12 lamp and that is a dollar store piece of white board. And I'm bouncing the light off of that onto here to make the light nice and soft on my face. Right. This is a clamp light that I bought at the Home, Art, the, the, the Home Depot for $12. Now, and it's just a regular light bulb. I'm gonna turn that on. Okay. So when I turn this off, suddenly it doesn't look quite as nice and soft. The other thing, by the way, and I'll go into my cabinet over here, is the type of light bulb what does this have to do with ethics and journalism? Everything. Because when you buy a light bulb, this is from Ikea. You see how there's a number on it? 2,700 degrees Kelvin. The lower the number, the more red the color is, okay? Uh, so anywhere in the 3,000 range, 3,000 Kelvin range gives you a warm color and it's great for human skin tone. If you go too high, you'll get a bluish color this lantern here is more of a bluish color. This is Stanley lantern. It's about 5,600 degrees Kelvin. So it's more blue, which makes me look more sickly, right? So that's a, in fact, I can show you. So this is a bluish light. And this one is more of a warm color. So it's better for human skin. So if I'm lighting the person from the oil industry with this bluish sickly looking light, it's gonna affect the way I look on camera versus the warm light. And what I did with this right there is that clamp light, again, $12. And then I bought an LED light bulb, right? That is about, uh, they call this the warm color. So you can get cool or warm. So I always buy the warm one. I put it in that light there. I bounce it off that piece of whiteboard. Not too bad, right? It warms it up. So it's, it's less blue and it's better for my skin tone. Uh, the other thing, technically, is how you light somebody in terms of soft or hard lighting. This is a soft light, so it's really quite forgiving and it's quite flattering. Uh, but if I use a hard light like this, right, it's much more shadowy. So that's not gonna come off too well. 
you see that see the, the hard light on my face see how it's much more dramatic lighting uh, the other thing by the way is if you don't want to buy a clamp light even a desk lamp with a regular light bulb like this bounce off a white uh, white piece of foam board uh, or even white paper right just tape that on a wall bounce that off you get a nice soft light um, but the light directly is a lot of hard hard lighting very unflattering uh, it's what we call dramatic lighting so if you watch uh, any of your movies tonight star wars or uh, Avengers, anything like that. It's very dramatic lighting. So it's very hard and unflattering lighting, right? So you want to make sure that you, um, when you're doing your interviews, you light people properly. Um, I know Amazon in Canada sells a whole bunch of really inexpensive lights that are pretty good uh, or a reflector. Um, you can buy a fold out reflector. I have one around here somewhere. Oh, it's over there pretty cheaply and it just bounces the sunlight into someone's face and it makes a difference. What I guess, and I, this is, again, this is the long game. If you start to elevate the, not that, listen, I haven't seen any of your work. I'm sure it's excellent. So please don't think I'm, I'm not trying to speak down to you. I'm trying to speak to you as a colleague, but what I've found is if you maintain excellence, right? When you shoot, you shoot like the other thing is eye level. Okay. So this camera shooting up at me. So you see my nose, this is not very flattering to me. So if I was doing an interview, it looks terrible. So you want, so I'm going to sit down and I'm going to shoot eye level to the camera. And the other thing I'm going to do too, and if you're ever on camera, don't sit square to the camera. See how I'm straight flat to the camera. It's very kind of aggressive. I'm going to turn my shoulders a little bit and I'm going to turn the camera like this. And by the way, this camera is a very wide angle lens. And because of that, it doesn't make me look really good. So I would switch to a closer camera. So there's all kinds of technical things you can do that have everything to do with ethics. So this is a closer camera. This is my built-in Dell camera, right? So it's a little better, right? A wide angle lens on your face, uh, or if you're shooting somebody, let's say you're, uh, this one's pretty wide, this camera here. So it's pretty wide angle. See if I go close, how weird it looks. It distorts my face, right? See, it's because it's the, the, the lens is stretching it out. It's wide angle. And when you frame somebody, you want to frame them at their armpits. So it's gender neutral, right? We don't see any advertisements on their chest. And then the, the headroom's about here and you have a fairly comfortable shot. So then I would look not into the camera. I would look off the camera this way. And so, and the other thing, by the way, I do as a journalist is uh, when I interview people, which camera's on this one now, I have four cameras set up here. But when I interview people, I, um, I bring my little reporter's notebook with me, okay? And what I do is when I sit down, I ask the person to print their name for me on, in the book. So they will print their name. So I have the spelling if I'm doing a TV story or a newspaper story, because they wrote it out in print. Uh, and then what I'll do is I will draw a picture uh, of, of, the, of the box. Let me do it like this. So I would just very quickly draw a picture like this uh can you see that right so i know which way their head is looking and which way their screen their their eyes are looking their screen direction is looking screen that way right so why do i do that because then when i so let's say that's point one we think that you should renegotiate with exxon then when i'm interviewing the second person i'm going to have them look the opposite way right so then the second person i'm going to frame looking the other way, okay? So when I cut these two clips together, it kind of looks like they're having a conversation. This is one side here, one side there. And then I'm able to build my story visually because I'm using the visuals to tell the story ethically as well. The way I light one person, I light the other person exactly the same, right? And again, see how wide the shot is here? This is way too wide. Look how small my head is compared to my massive body. And that's COVID. <laughs> uh, no. So I want to shoot with a tighter shot. Uh, and the other thing I would strongly recommend is, uh, is even if you're just doing, um, look at that. See, that's pretty good, right? So the camera's here, but I'm going to look off the camera. So I'm looking at the reporter, not into the lens of the camera. There's something called the subjective objective barrier. If I look straight into the camera, 
it's um, it's not subjective because I'm talking directly to the audience. Sometimes you see politicians do that. They'll actually, instead of talking to the reporter, they'll turn and look into the camera and say, no, we shouldn't renegotiate with Exxon. We got the best deal we, we could possibly get. So you want them looking offset like this way towards the reporter. Um, medium close up, see how there's a better balance between my head and my body. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm going to give you one of the resources is, a, is an article I wrote for Ryerson about how to look fabulous on a webcam, how to frame yourself up. But eye level is a neutral shot, right? Uh, let's go back to one of these other cameras for a second. Let's do this one. Um, is it switching? All right. So this is looking down at me, right? So that's, that's not objective. I'm, you're looking down on me. That's different. And if you shoot up at me, that's also not objective. You want to shoot at eye level. And you want to take five minutes and do some nice lighting with somebody. Because I'll tell you, if people see like, you know, when, uh, when, that, when that person shoots me, they, I look really good on camera. They care about the, the, the framing, the lighting. Um, the other thing too, by the way, is uh, when I'm framing somebody, watch the background, right? So that can, that can influence the shot quite, uh, or, or what they're talking about, right? So um, I don't know if any of you noticed my license plates. This is from Jurassic Park, not the real one. And this is from a TV show, Magnum PI, a couple of things. Uh, the problem is words. People will read words behind you. Uh, I've got this, uh, one of the things when I teach, I put this uh, nice waterfall. Actually, the reason I bought this TV was to have a waterfall behind me during, uh, during my uh, class time. So it's, it's nice, it's soothing, right? And it's, uh, I get tired of virtual backgrounds. Uh, but but take take and take time right like and again some of you noticed my train set right here so when I was doing my uh, class setup I thought it'd be great fun to have a train that I can run in the break and the students were like yeah let's have a train so I went and bought this 500 bucks the silly thing costs because there's two of them and the track is really expensive and anyways but but I run it on the break right and and I've had students say to me basically you know if you're spending that time and effort on your setup then I'm inspired to do the same thing. I'll go out and spend $30 on a reflector. I'll go out and, you know, I actually had another student built some kind of a studio under a staircase in his basement, right? A little production space because it inspired him. And one of the things I think you'll find as a journalist, as if, you're, uh, if your stuff technically is good, I think you can inspire people. I really think um, that, that if you stand true, and, and I, again, I don't know what you watch, but one of the, I love shows where people take a stand and they, they, they're people of integrity and they won't be bought, you know, and they, they're given a check and they give it right back and they say, I don't want your money. Because unfortunately, I think we live in a world where money buys a lot of stuff, right? Oh, I'll just, I'll just pay you for that. And, uh, and, and it's awful. It's really generally terrible that people, you know, that we think money is such a big influencer. So technically watch your stuff when you're doing a radio interview with, with people, one of the things, and I don't know how you, what technology you use. There's a piece of software called voice record pro and Kitty, maybe you can just type that into the, um, the chat voice record pro. Uh, we like it. It's free. You can use it on uh, Apple or Android and it is an excellent little, um, uh, really great uh, voice record pro. Uh, let me just show you what that looks like. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely uh, costs nothing, but what it does is it gives me a little uh, voice recorder, right? Uh, like this. And so when I push record, it gives me uh, options. Do I want to record it as MP4, right? I can change that. Uh, I can make it, um, AAC or uh, MP4. MP4 is a compressed file. If you have an option to do a WAV file, a WAV file, WAV file is not compressed. So the quality will be better. And then um, you can also see there's a bit rate right here. See that says bit rate. Uh, 196 uh, megabits per second. 196 megabits per second is CD quality. So if you have a chance to set it, Set it to 196 megabits per second. Does that mean anything to you? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But record it at the highest quality you can. And then I just record it. And when I record it, I have a VU meter. VU stands for volume units, right? And you want the VU to be between the zero and the three, right in there. See how it's bouncing around? So what I tell students is, um, especially if you, so maybe, maybe this is the thing. If you can't find a local expert, then go elsewhere. And here's the great thing with the internet. 
And the great thing was Zoom. First of all, uh, we are not even in the same country, a lot of us, and I'm able to talk to you. <clears throat> Imagine, like I, I tell my students, if, if COVID hit in the 1970s, school would just be closed. <laughs> there was no internet. There was nothing. Imagine that, right? Um, and, and you're like, I've got, <laughs> that's it. You can't, you can't work, but we're able to work remotely. So what I tell people is um, you can do a Zoom interview with somebody, right? So you can't find a local expert, find someone who's out of the country who will say, I'll speak to that point. Sure, that's, you know, um, or maybe look at another country that has a, a deal with Exxon and they hate the deal. Exxon's taking advantage of them or, you know, call our friends in Louisiana where the Exxon Valdez or the, that wasn't, it was the, the Ocean Ranger or whatever the name of that oil spill was there, right? Uh, and I've been to Valdez, Alaska, by the way. They've done a beautiful job cleaning it up up there. Uh, not that it was right to spill in the first place. But um, so this is, an, oh, so what I do is, um, some of you have multiple phones. You know how you have an old phone that you just don't use? Uh, what I will have people do, because the, the weak link, generally, if you're doing a, um, a television or any kind of audio production podcast, is the sound. This microphone here is an $800 microphone, all right? Uh, but I also tell people what you can do is use Voice Record Pro. The microphone's on the bottom of my uh, cell phone, or my smartphone, so I can push record like this. It's recording, so the, the volume unit meter is working. And then it's, I'm going to turn it upside down so the microphone is here, and then I'm just going to hold it outside of the frame. So now, uh, it, let's say you're interviewing somebody over the Internet, and the, and the, the audio is terrible because it's cutting out. Um, just say to them, can you record it on your phone? Even the most phones have just a voice recorder of some kind. Just hold it outside of the frame like this. And now when I play it back, the sound quality is going to be better than my laptop sound. It'll be absolutely great. Right. And the other thing too, technically is when you talk, your chest vibrates. There's a chest cavity that gives your voice resonance. If you actually hold the voice recorder what i do is i actually hold it into my chest so it actually picks up the resonance of my chest which gives a really nice rich sound on my voice record pro and then what you have them do is just have them send you the audio file can you just email that to me because audio files are really tiny so that way if you have a zoom or zoom call with somebody uh if you're doing say a video clip for television because it isn't just TV anymore. It's Instagram. It's uh, it's Twitter. You're putting video clips on. You want to you want to see the person. Um, you actually have a really nice quality audio clip. You can put it in a podcast, um, and it's it costs them nothing to do. Years ago, when I was doing my research for my PhD, I was down in California. I flew down there to interview someone. I just wanted to do like a. I was just going to tape the uh, record it uh, the interview. But my professor said to me, uh, Darlene said, you know, Gary, you should videotape it should get it. I said, well, why? I'm only doing an audio clip. She said, well, because you can see the facial expressions, et cetera. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. And if you're doing video, the other thing, if you really want it to be fabulous is you use, you have them record the, uh, not through Zoom, but you have them record like to, you use Zoom as the, to do the interview with, but you actually have them talk into their camera and send you the video clip of that as well. Um, if you ever need some technical help or whatever, just send me an email, ggould at ryerson.ca. I'm really very happy to to help each of you in any way I can. Absolutely free. I'm just, uh, we're all in this together. Um, but but if you have an audio clip, and the other thing too, this speaks to the veracity of your sources. If someone says, well, maybe you quoted me wrong. You say, oh no, here's the clip. I'm going to play back the audio, right? Um, and and people will say, oh, okay. Uh, what software do, do edit videos? Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, these are quick questions. Actually, Kitty, maybe, is there some questions in the chat that I'm missing? There it was a question. Yes. What software do you recommend to edit videos? Could you be more specific on the Amazon that ca that Canada lighting you mentioned? Yeah. Um, okay. So Amazon um, has a, a bunch of stuff called um, newer N E W like E E R N like new E E R something like that. That's their house brand. And they literally sell everything. Um, if money is an issue, there's another company that I love called Ali Express, A-L-I Express. And basically, it's a lot of the same stuff that, uh, that Amazon sells, but in, Amazon imports it from China and then resells it to me. <clears throat> Ali Express, boom, straight to the source. Uh, for example, this is something I needed. This is an HDMI video capture. 
And what it allows me to do is it takes an HDMI video source and I can plug it into my laptop. So I can take a, a, a regular DSLR camera and hook it up to my Zoom call, okay? I paid $12 for that and that from, from AliExpress, the exact same thing on Amazon's 20 or $25, right? So uh, now the only thing is it takes forever. It takes months and months and months to get here sometimes, um, but it's, uh, it's excellent. Uh, most of my webcams, right uh are from aliexpress uh like this one here uh this one right uh any kind of external webcam uh actually this is one of, this is one of my best ones here uh this is 70 dollars uh, on best buy and i paid 25 or 30 for it half price through aliexpress uh, and it makes a difference um and what you want to get is a reflector actually you know what since you're paying the big money let me just grab a reflector and I'll so the reflector, this is one I bought when I was in the US. Um, and what this is, um, this has everything to do with ethics because I can make people look better. If people are all dark and shadowy, it, people visually, you, the eyes, they don't agree. They say, well, that person looks all shadowy and it unfolds into a giant silver reflector, but it also has different colors. There's gold, there's white, there's a bunch of colors. Um, but what I tell people too is, just a piece of white foam board for a dollar makes a huge difference, right? Let me see if I can show you. Well, I, the, my lighting's pretty good, but um, go here. If I turn that light off, see how shadowy it looks? And as a journalist, part of my job is a technical job to say, oh, well, you know what? That person looks, uh, it looks too dark or it looks really um, out of focus, right? Um, so what you can use... Gary, we can't really hear you when you are away from the microphone. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm back. <laughs> yes. Well, and that speaks to the point too. If you can't hear somebody, then what good is it? Like, and, and if, if people are straining to hear, if you do a podcast or you, you do an audio clip, because one of the things that's changed, if you were a, a newspaper reporter in the old days, you just reported like you you might record your um, your interviews and then you would type up your story and that would be done. But with online news, you're now doing the photos. You're now taking pictures. And uh, the other thing when you're taking pictures, you're not just taking them horizontally. You're taking them vertically because they have to fill the space on the page. Right. And they want audio clips and they want video. Oh, well, we want some video of that parade because what I think people find is people will go to certain websites to watch stuff. We want to, oh, we want to watch that protest. We want to, like when that statue was pulled down, I looked, I saw a photo of it, but then I went and saw, I went and found a video of it being pulled over. And that's, people want to see things. They like things that move. And that's the beautiful thing with, with, with video is that you can do the moving. And I'll answer the question about the editing in a minute. Um, but yeah, so it really doesn't take much to, to make your stuff look really good. Sorry, I'm back. So I can just take a desk lamp, right? And here's the whiteboard. I'm gonna bounce the whiteboard. So I'm gonna just bounce the light off the whiteboard and look at the shadows on my face, right? <clears throat> and suddenly I look great. You know, some of your friends have gone out and bought those ring lights. I have one of them over there, um, but why? Why not just use a, a desk lamp that I have sitting around anyways? Right, I've got a LED light bulb, so it's not hot. It's the low, it's the nice color temperature, about 3000 degrees Kelvin, right? The warm one is the one you want. In terms of editing software, um, there's a bunch of stuff uh, that you can get for free. If you have a Mac, uh, the, uh, what's the iMovie, I think is what it's called, it's pretty good. Uh, there's a video editor on Windows as well, that's not bad. There's a free one called Caden Live, K-D-E-N. Uh, that's a free online one. Shotcut is another one, S-H-O-T, cut. Uh, and technically, I'll also tell you too, <clears throat> if your smartphone records in 4K, um, the resolution will be very good. Uh, but the problem is you need a lot of computer processor um, power to be able to... Um, uh, drive your, um, to drive your story, you know, um, because your computer will slow down and it also takes up a lot of space. I don't, uh, one of the reasons I like the Android platform technically is because I can switch out the SD card. So when I'm working on assignment, I will bring extra SD cards, uh, so I can change them out. I was, uh, shooting in Cambodia 
at Angor Wat and I was trying to record the sunrise and suddenly my phone was full. So I just switched out the card and it was fine. Um, the more that you can bring in what, I guess what I'm, one of the things that we, we do as journalists is we're not, we're not really trying to entertain people, but we, but it's part of the process. If I can tell a story in an interesting way, right? Why wouldn't I do that? Right. Uh, one of the things too, I mean, again, I work a lot in television, but one of the things with the extractives industry, it's very visual. It's very, very visual. Like it's, it's not like, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I can't think of something, but I don't know. Let's say it's writing. Let's, let's say I'm doing a story on book editing and it's just people sitting typing on their computer all day, right? Editing books. Uh, that's not nearly as visually interesting as mining or oil and gas or, or, or you know, because it's all moving, right? That's why I love the train, right? Which, by the way, is part, I mean, I mean, that's part of it. How do you get the stuff to market, right? Through trains, it's a, it's a big part of it, right? Movement and people really like the visualization that comes with that. Um, and so um, as a journalist, you want to have a certain amount of tools, right? Especially with the interviews, um, they sell a soft box light. It's just a big reflector light. It's about $50. What I can do after the next break, I'll put some links in the, in the chat uh, of stuff that, uh, that, that we found works really quite nicely. The other thing is when you show up with, um, with, with, with the right equipment, people say, Oh, you actually know what you're doing. The best thing that you will ever buy is that reflector. Cause they're about $30 Canadian. It folds out and it, it's a game changer. Cause I can use any light, right. And bounce it into someone's face. Uh, inside, I use the silver side outside. I use the white side. It's too much outside. A few use the silver. Um, but now let's talk about, okay. So we do interviews. One of the things that we want to also talk about to sort of continue on that stage, when we do the interviews, technically we want the sound to be good. Right. And, and again, because as Kitty, you just said, I go off microphone and you can't hear me anymore. And when you can't hear me because I'm off microphone, you dis you disconnect. The most important part of any a television or, um, or f video is really the audio, right? Because if I can't hear um, the sound, I mean, how many times have you said with Zoom over the last year and a half, oh, you're muted, I can't hear you, right? It's all about being muted, right? Um, now, let's talk about anonymous sources. So if uh, the question was saying we have a hard time Harry. finding... Yeah. Before we move on, there is a question sure. specific to these recordings. So okay. the question is, on videos, what is your recommendation on the text captions as part of an interview and inserting images during editing of the video? Okay, so this is what I would recommend for, because we, we now do closed captioning. Uh, it's the law in Ontario where I live. Um, so what I do is I will shoot the highest quality that you can, edit the highest quality that you can, because you can always downgrade the quality, but you can never go back up. Does that make sense? So make sure when you're recording your your video clips, if you're using video, always use a tripod. Um, that's something you should spend money on. And you can actually get adapters. Like here's a tripod that I have. This is a, a monopod, but it's got this bracket on the top so I can clip my cell phone in. And the other thing too, when you're shooting, always shoot horizontal. Don't shoot this way. <clears throat> Just don't. If I shoot horizontal, I can pull out a vertical clip, but if I shoot vertically, I cannot pull out a horizontal clip. Um, so um, be aware of that. And then in terms of text captioning, what I will do is when I finish editing it, I've, I've spent hundreds of hours probably um, closed captioning stuff that I've done. Uh, but the easier way is upload it to YouTube, right? Even let's say you don't want anybody to see it. You can make it private so only you can see it. And YouTube has an excellent closed captioning, uh, auto closed captioning process. So upload it and then you can go into closed captioning uh, and download it um, through an SRT file uh, or, or download the SRT file. That's the text file. And then you can upload it into, uh, I guess it depends on where you're putting it. But but yeah, the, uh, the, the, the text captioning is... Um, uh, that's what I, that's closed captioning is, is excellent. Um, if somebody is hard to hear, you might put in text boxes right underneath it. If their mic is bad or some, for some reason, if you just cannot quite hear what they're saying. Um, 
And then to remember what I said, people want moving active images. You want the pictures to be interesting, movement in the frame, see how the waterfall is moving, as opposed to a lot of camera movement. <clears throat> Shaky camera, nobody appreciates that. We want absolute dead solid, right? It's very comfortable. Um, and um, yeah, I like, Sony Vegas is a program that I've used over the years. I've, that's one you have to buy, it's very good. Uh, we use Premiere Pro at Ryerson, but it's too expensive and it's too much to rent. And if you're just putting stuff online, I don't think you really need it. Um, again, Shotcut's kind of a um, a knockoff that's free. Caden Live, I tested. That was pretty good as well. I like that one. And then there's another company called DaVinci, DaVinci Resolve. Um, that is a pro-level editor, but it takes a lot and it's free. Uh, but it takes a lot of computer processing power. So you might find it really slow. And if you're doing 4K material, it's really slow to edit, right? Um, and just make sure that when you say something, you see something, right? This, uh, this remote control is excellent, right? My smartphone is very helpful, right? So say it, see it, say it, see it. And then last point, which isn't really what I had planned to talk about today, but I'm going to mention it too, um, sequences. Uh, on the next break, I'm going to put a link to how to do a sequence, how to shoot a video sequence. That's the game changer, right? A sequence is where you, you tell, you do a series of pictures to, to tell a story, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. I'll put a link in there in the chat so you can see that, <clears throat> or maybe I'll put it in the resources. I have a resources page at the end. I, I want to talk to you briefly though about anonymous sources, because that might be something that helps you. Um, and then I think there's a question about J school degree, which I'm happy to uh, talk about as well. Um, uh, also too, I'm, I'm also very, very happy to share any resources that I have absolutely free. Um, again, uh, it's like a, a family of journalism, uh, professionals, and I'm certainly happy to share what information that I have resources, anything that can be helpful to you. Um, does an anonymous source, does it call into question the reliability of the source? Uh, you have to ask yourself, what's the motivation? Let's say somebody says, I'll give you the quote, but I don't want to be on camera. I want to be anonymous. Um, you just ask yourself, well, why do they want to remain anonymous? Is it a reasonable uh, explanation or does it seem suspicious? Um, would somebody else, could you get another source to say the same thing, right? Uh, or is it maybe an urgent issue and you need to uh, deal with it right away? And the question was, or the comment earlier was, we have a hard time getting any quotes, right, from the government. Okay, so then maybe you explore the world of anonymous sources. <clears throat> and um, if you get a reliable source, uh, and some of us have them, you just develop a source with, uh, with someone, you know, who um, just isn't... Uh, I don't know, they, they're not too happy with the government, but they just don't want to put their name on it because they're afraid for the, the reprisals that would come from that, right? Um, and is, you know, as long as you've, like, what I would say is I would explore every option. I would try to get any source that I could. And then if it came down to it and I had to use an anonymous source and I believed it to be true, um, or if it, it seemed provable, right? Um, maybe, you, maybe you've proven something's true, but you, you can't actually, you're not sure how to, uh, like you just, you, you hear things, but you can't say, maybe you heard stuff off the record. And so you can't use that material, yeah. but then you have somebody who'll go on the record, but they want to do it anonymous. I would say I would use it as a last resort and there has to be a compelling reason to use it. I also think to the point of if the government's not talking to you, if the extractive industry is, is not talking to you, <clears throat> change it over. Like it's over time, keep being a person of integrity, keep being someone who checks their sources, don't be a mouthpiece. So if they send you a press uh, you know, uh, release, you're not gonna be the one that just just reiterates it and revert, uh, uh, rewrites it, right? It's the idea of being transparent. I would tell the audience and to say, look, straight up, this is what we're told. We're not able to prove this. There's no, we've tried multiple times. Nobody at the government will talk to us. And um, the thing is that, you know, people are going to ask questions about the story and um, you, you really have to be careful with using an anonymous source because it's just sort of some, it's sort of like an, well, some of us have seen anonymous comments, you know, and people can be really 
nasty or say things that are really out, you know, way out in left field. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the other, the, I guess the other caution I would have with it, uh, let's say somebody comes to you with this, this tip, um, make sure you fully resort, uh, um, research it because it, you might be being used. Maybe they send someone along with this, you know, this fact that, that, you know, they're trying to get somebody else, you know, kicked out of government or in trouble. And so even though the person's telling you isn't the person that's going to benefit from it, somebody else who's going to benefit set them up. Uh, so make sure you write the story that um, that you think is there, not the one that they're necessarily trying to tell you. So so don't be afraid again to, you know, to to come back and say this. this I don't I just don't believe it's true. Uh, I, I got a quote from uh, um, there's a uh, lots of great online resources. Uh, um, uh, one quote I um, this is about uh, divulging your source. On sources, you're absolutely right. You can never divulge a source's details except with their permission uh, and to your editor. Uh, but you can help the reader by explaining why the source is someone to be listened to by saying they witnessed events, they're working inside an organization or whatever without giving away anything that would identify them. And I totally agree with you that being transparent as possible and show step-by-step -step your reporting Maybe this requires a separate sidebar if you cannot uh, elaborate on it within the article, right? There's no easy answer to that, but the idea is <clears throat> why should people listen to this person? And then you might explain like, look, they work inside the government, but clearly they don't want to be identified because they don't want to be identified. Uh, they like their job, right? They like their job. Um, the third point is, again, this goes to the idea of being responsible and, um, you are responsible for what's out there. So let's say you name a source that shouldn't have been named. Well, you, you put them in peril. Uh, and the other thing is, again, think of the long game. Like um, the problem with activist journalism is what happens when that, um, when that issue goes away. <clears throat> let's, say, let's say you win. Let's say the government renegotiates with Exxon and everything's great. Well, now you're the news agency that's no longer a news agency. You're kind of like a lobbyist group, right? And people say, well, you know, sure, that might they the end game might have been OK, but in the long run, you're kind of burning your bridges with uh, with everybody because you're like, well, you're the agency. If you don't like it, you're just going to pick a side. And that's, I think, not what we're there to do. I think we're there to to speak truth to power and to um, find the balance and and find voices that are not, you know, give give a voice to the voiceless. Uh, but you're responsible for your work and television is very powerful. The images, I mean, I, I don't know if you watch American news, but you, if you watch what's going on in the U S especially with the police cameras, you know, them uh, with that one, uh, you know, the number of people killed by the police and they're in custody. It's terrible. Uh, video is very, very, very powerful. And you need to use it carefully. That's why, I, again, I teach lighting as part of, oh, let me turn back on my good light. Um, I teach lighting. I want to look my fabulous best for you all, um, right? I teach lighting as part of what I do. Um, but uh, yeah, you, it's, all, it's, it's a whole process. It isn't just one, one thing. It's, um, all right, uh, what's, who else can I call? Or... Um, Again, especially if you're dealing with the extractives industry, and there was a great question about the Canadian industry, and maybe that's something we can find uh, and get to you. Uh, maybe there's experts in Canada that will speak to, to what's going on in, in, in different countries. And, and maybe that way, if your local experts are all biased because they have, uh, they have an interest, right? They, maybe that's a job for them for the next 100 years. Uh, find someone who has no interest. And, and look outside a country and look in a, you know, maybe a neighboring country or somewhere else where someone will say, yeah, I'll speak to that. That's a, that's a terrible deal, right? Um, but, uh, and if you make a mistake, don't be afraid to admit it. You know, uh, if you need to put a printer retraction or you, you're not always right. And sometimes you're wrong and just say, you know what, we were wrong. And again, that goes to your credibility, um, willing to make uh, admissions or uh, to uh, admit you're wrong. I think will make the audience trust you more. And this again goes to the idea of transparency with your audience is that, okay, I screwed up. I shouldn't have done that. And um, 
I am going to do things differently the next time. And and listen to the audience too. I mean, just this the thing we like about the chat anytime you're in a Zoom room is I get to hear what you're thinking and questions. And um, and this is the same thing uh, in real life. Listen to your audience. There's lots of ways that people can send you notes and um, you can get feedback from them. Um, and um, you just have to be careful, uh, be, be very responsible. Like let's say you, you, you're recording someone and they have a wireless microphone on and um, you can buy little wireless microphones. This is the transmitter. This is an Amazon purchase, like it plugs into my smartphone and then the, the, the microphone is just clips onto the person. Uh, but a wireless mic, sometimes people forget that they're on and they'll, um, they'll walk away and they'll be talking to somebody else and I can still hear what they're saying. So you wanna make sure that you don't take advantage of people, I think, because people remember. And is the one story worth, like, think of, sometimes it's like not the story you're dealing with, it's the next story you have to think about, right? Well, I could do it this time, but what happens the next time? That person will never talk to me again. Uh, a friend of mine actually uh, was a, as a photojournalist and um, he was with the prime minister of Canada, a guy named Pierre, uh, no, it was uh, Chrétien, John Chrétien. And he was skiing with them, right? And he was just taking shots of him skiing. Well, he got this great shot of him wiping out, right? Like, like this, whoa, right, crazy shot. And the prime minister said to him, uh, I guess that's going to be in the news tonight. And he said, no, no. He said, uh, you're a great skier. Uh, this picture makes you look like a buffoon. And um, I'm not going to use it. I'm going to tell you the same, uh, the same guy was telling me um, he used to be part of the American press corps uh, in the White House. He covered the White House. He said when he first started, when he was kind of a, a new photojournalist, they were trying him out. So they sent him to uh, the, the airport and then they said, um, uh, the president's arriving and um, uh, you're going you're gonna to be on the tarmac, right? So he was there. And there was three other, he was working for Associated Press and there was three other photographers. So they gave him the worst spot. The others were up on like high uh, scaffolding and he was at the low area and the plane came in and just happened to stop right in front of him. So he had the perfect view of the doorway and he was taking pictures. Uh, I think it was President Johnson, I wanna say, cause he's, this was a long time ago. Anyways, as the guy came off the plane, he slipped on the stairs and fell. And uh, Peter, the photographer, had his camera on like moto drive and got all the pictures of him falling down the stairs. Well, um, of course, uh, it turns out in the end, he was the only photographer that got those photos in the press that night because it was raining and everyone had their umbrellas up and all the other positions, uh, they couldn't see the fall because were, the umbrellas were hiding it. And um, the problem for that, for that president was that people thought he would look like a bit of a buffoon because he was like, he fell down the stairs, right? It didn't make them look good. And so the pictures you use really do influence. The, in fact, it's so interesting because Peter said to me, it's too bad because he said of all the presidents I covered, <clears throat> he was probably the most athletic, this guy, President Johnson. We used to play football like he was a former football player in college, like he was very athletic. He just slipped on the, the metal stairs in the rain. Right. Um, so there are consequences to um, uh, and an impact to what your you know, people people are watching. Um, and again, I understand that competition makes it tough because you want to sort of keep up with them, uh, lots of pressures. And sometimes you're influenced to show stuff just because someone else is showing you. Right. Uh, and then finally, just, and then we'll move, we'll take a break and then we'll move to more of a data journalism thing. And just the idea of be, uh, excluded from the influence of others. This is the, the points here. Uh, and basically what I mean by that is, um, you are, you know, just, I, I know it's hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of it's, you know, kind of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Um, but you want to make sure that the, the material that you're putting out is, um, let me go here, this one here. I'm going to just share that just so you can see the breakdown. So uh, just excluded from the influence of others. You're not there as a, as a mouthpiece. You're not there as a bullhorn. You're not trying to promote anybody. Um, you are not trying to, um, you know, be something, you know, uh, yeah, that's not your job. You are, again, in the words of the Washington Post, you know, darkness or uh, democracy dies in darkness. You're bringing light into the room. And um, 
And this is the point here. And, and this is where I think you might, hopefully this will be helpful to you. And the idea is working with partners and building a, a network. It's, it's hard when you're working in a country that, and again, I don't, I don't know your country, uh, but if you're, it's, it's hard if you're working in a country uh, that is not open, right? That the government is um, hiding things or they, they won't give you quotes. Uh, it's, um, sorry. I'm trying to find it here. I might have to find it after the break. Let me do that. <laughs> I just call it there. Uh, yeah. Welcome to technology. I've my, my tab closed on me, uh, but we'll, we'll watch it when we come back. But the idea basically is, um, use, um, use journalists in other countries, right? Don't be afraid to, um, you know, to speak out and to, oh, here it is. This is what I'm looking for here. Um, yeah, so I, I've got a, I've got an example here. Salim Amin, Amin uh, is a journalist in Nairobi, and um, he talks about a difficult, how difficult it was to work in, um, in his country during the election. And so this is a real short clip from from what he's suggesting, but I think it's actually a good idea. Uh, I like I, good ideas. And this is a this is the idea of if you can't say something because you're afraid, maybe you can work together and 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 um, have others say what you are trying to say. So let me just clip over to him. And then, uh, all right, you should see him and let's listen to him. It's only I mean, two minutes. It's the, the partnership and the cooperation is very, very important, as much as you can do. Um, you know, I, I take it more on a pan-African uh, continental level, not, rather than just in one country, um, where the advantages of when you're talking about big stories, dangerous stories to cover, the, the advantage of having such a good network around the region is that if you expose, as a, journal, a Kenyan journalist, if you come across a story that's really sensitive, but you know very important about corruption or about politics that needs to be told, but you are afraid because it's in your backyard and you don't want to, to kind of expose yourself to that uh, story. Having a, a relationship, a network with journalists in Uganda or Tanzania or Rwanda and calling on them to say, guys, listen, this is the story, you know, I'll be your guy on the ground, but I need you guys to come, one of you, two of you to come and work with me and then publish this under your byline because you can go back to Tanzania or Uganda, Rwanda, wherever, and I don't have to, you know, that there won't be that consequence to you reporting. And I think we found this very, very, um, our network very useful during the 2008 post-election violence in Kenya. And we brought in our stringers from Uganda, Tanzania, um, and uh, Ethiopia actually to cover the, the the stories here because our journalists and our um, camera people and producers were of a particular ethnicity. They're all of different ethnicity, but we had to be very careful where we sent them because their ethnicity would be could be held against them depending on which location they were in. Whereas if they were Uganda and Tanzania, it didn't really matter. They had much more freedom of movement in some of these areas. So. You know, I think that network cannot be emphasized enough that it's really important if you have a, a, a network of journalists, not necessarily in your own country, that's also very helpful, but people in the region that understand the dynamics of, of the politics in each country because it's very similar in their own countries and can, can cross borders to help each other tell very important stories and, and have a little bit of a buffer against the local correspondent. Uh, I thought uh, that's a great idea. I really, um, in researching, uh, I think that's uh, an excellent uh, way to look at it. Um, and the thing is with uh, data journalism in particular, it's, uh, it really is a prime candidate for working as a team where you collaborate and communicate with, uh, with other partners when you're looking at uh, material, because a lot of times it's uh, materials quite extensive. Um, and you see that where different news agencies will team up on stuff like the Edward Snowden stuff. Um, there's like an example uh, where there was different uh, uh, people involved with that project. 
Uh, and when they released the information, they released it with a bunch of newspapers. It wasn't just one. Um, I think it was John F. Kennedy that said, uh, it's amazing how much work you'll get done if nobody cares who gets the credit, something to that effect. And listen, I know it's an, it's, it's a, uh, an income, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, people have to make a living. Um, but sometimes if you can maybe build a kind of a, a community of, of, um, uh, of news uh, of journalists that you can work together on um, and you can collaborate, um, uh, you might find there's some advantages to that. Um, there's a, I came across a few uh, existing networks uh, there's one called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. There's one called the African Forum for Investigative Reporting. There's one called the Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. Another one called the Journalism Investigative Journalism. Or sorry, the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Um, and then the the Panama Papers is another example where it was broken by the uh, ICIJ, which is the uh, International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, uh, and again a global network. Um, it's easy for people to ignore one. It's harder for them to ignore two or 10 or 20, right? And um, uh, sometimes too, uh, you'll see uh, some collaboration with hackers who will get information. Uh, they have software uh, that they, uh, tools or access to software. There's some ethical questions around that as well. So I'm not suggesting you do, but, but sometimes some of that gets, uh, uh, plays a role. And um, the other thing is collaboration is essential for if you're a freelance data journalist and you work for um, maybe a media outlet that doesn't have their own data experts, this allows you to uh, tap into your own network. And an example of that is the European Data Journalism Network. And basically it's a network of independent media organizations and newsrooms that produce and promote data-driven coverage of European topics in several languages. Uh, they've been doing that since 2017. So uh, it's journalists, developers, policy experts. Uh, the other thing with a team, which is nice, is we all have different skills uh, and also gives you something like a sounding board. Like, does this sound okay? Did, did, you know, if you ever had anybody like read something, like you're going to send someone a letter, can you just read through? Does this sound okay? Um, and I think what you're going to find is that uh, there's, there's strength in two. There's a proverb that says... Um, a cord of two and three is not easily as cut, something to that effect. The idea is if there's more than one of you. Um, and I th think, you know, um, again, I know it's, uh, if, if, if you're getting paid for the story, it's, you don't want to split the money because it's, it's not a lot of money sometimes anyways. Um, but if you can collaborate and work together, I think you might find um, there's advantages to that. Um, in the resource page that I'm going to give you, now, one of the things uh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, some, we'll talk about this in the next half, but um, some actual um, uh, apps you can use to create some pretty good looking content. Uh, I'm going to give you a bunch of handbooks and um, uh, reference guide links that are really quite good. Um, some articles and um, there's a few handbooks that are available free online that are very, very helpful if uh, on data journalism and um um, yeah, there's one, the Global Investigative Journalism Network. They've got a whole bunch of resources that are free, some really great stuff there. Um, there's a blog. I think there's even now a podcast on data journalism as well. So um, the best one, uh, well, I'll come back to this after the break. I'll talk about the resources at the end. But I just wanted to say this. Um, you're Even if you're alone, you're not alone because... The thing that I've found is that journalists, even if you work for a different company, you kind of get it. It makes, it's, I, I don't know if you have this in your, in your country, uh, but in Canada, if you own a Jeep, Jeep owners wave at each other, right? I don't know why, but they just do. And they say, it's a Jeep thing. A buddy of mine rides a motorcycle in Canada. Motorcyclists, they wave at each other, right? I don't know why they just do because there's a connection. I ride a motorcycle. It's a certain type of person. I drive a Jeep. It's a certain type of person. I'm a journalist, certain type of person. Right. And, um, and maybe that's the thing. Like if, if a group, if a, if a coalition of journalists phone and said, look, there's 15 of us, um, you know, we want to, uh, we, we want to know like, where's you know, this story needs to be, there's no confirmation given. Although I guess the problem, and I could be wrong, but I'm going to extrapolate from what was said. If the government will only speak to certain media outlets, right? Cause they have their favorite ones. 
I'm guessing the favored ones probably say nice things about the government. That's just a guess. And then those agencies don't want to jeopardize their access to the government because by bringing you into some kind of coalition. Um, but I do think the reality is if everybody knows, like I don't watch Fox news and I don't know what you know about it, but just what I've heard about it, like it's, you know, uh, I just, it's just not my thing. Right. Clearly. And so if, if, if there's a news agency, that's just sort of a government mouthpiece, I'm like, well, it's just a government mouthpiece. I'm not going to really believe what they say, but there's another journalist that's writing, uh, you know, a blog or something. And by the way, in terms of opinions, it's okay to have an opinion. You know, there's lots of great opinion pieces in the news. Um, and, and maybe, maybe that's the thing. If you're doing neutral journalism, but you actually think the government should renegotiate with Exxon, you know, it's okay to do an opinion piece on that. Here's why I think we should, right? That's okay. But again, too, once you become a certain type of journalist, that's you're the person with the opinion. You write the, the op-ed column. You are always, you know, writing uh, opinions. Uh, I have several people I know that have done that, but it's harder to go back to pure journalism if you're if you're just sort of talking about your uh, your opinion. Um, all right, uh, Kitty, any, any questions in the chat that I missed? And then we'll take a short break and then we'll come back and finish it up. And then I think you mentioned something about a survey if they have to leave early. Yes, yes, I saw that a couple of people had to leave early. So I wanted to make sure that we capture everybody's feedback. And uh, I'm not sure if you gathered, if you responded to the question about journalism degree. Oh, I did not. What was the question? Maybe you can read it. I, I didn't yeah, it. how important is a university journalism degree for a professional journalist? I would say uh, zero, um, only in the sense, if you have training in some other, I shouldn't say zero because I teach at a journalism school. Um, I think it's helpful. Okay, this is what I found journalism school is helpful for. It's helpful for giving you a basic understanding, um, um, some resources, some tools. Um, I, well, I can tell you, I, I worked with, uh, Raina and I both worked with a guy, Desmond Smith, who was a very recognized journalist. He never spent any time in any J school. He learned on the job. He worked at a newspaper, started delivering by delivering the paper, worked himself into the, like a copy boy, they called him back in the day, and then started writing and became a journalist. And, um, and that was fine. All of his experience was on the job. Um, Journalism school is very helpful if you're looking for a network. What we found is that when you graduate, they're often take a journalism school student because they have some ex some experience. They've done some internships. They have, you know, a little bit of knowledge about it. But I don't think it's absolutely critical. Like Desmond would say, not at all. But I would say I think it's helpful. Um, and then what I but what I do think is important is education. If, before, if some of you have to leave early, what I'm going to do in the chat, I think I can put the stuff. So right now, don't leave yet. I'm going to if you can. In the chat, I am going to see if I can upload um, the, this, these resources. So let's see if this will work. Uh, did that work? Let's hope it is. Okay, so there's the resource. Download that. There are some excellent courses through Night, uh, what's it called? Night, um, I will say Night Lab, but I don't know if that's what it's, uh, Night Lab gives you some, uh, some stuff. The Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas course, go through there. There's a, a phenomenal amount of resources there in terms of courses you can take. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you absolutely should download, um, there's a verification handbook. That is excellent. That's free. That's a download as well. Uh, there's, uh, uh, let's see, their website. Oh, the other thing I'm going to give you uh, here, I'm going to give you my own article. This is something I've done for how to shoot for television, framing, etc. That's uh, the uh, gold standard handbook. Um, there's another really great article, this one here, called Words That Matter. And it depends on where you're working, but the words that you use do make a difference. Uh, and then actually, I have the verification handbook here. I'm just going to drop it here. Right. And so those and in the resource page, I put a whole bunch of links to uh, some really great stuff. Um, I think as a journalist, you learn on the job because stuff comes up like every story is different. <clears throat> so you go to J school and Dr. Gould says to you, oh, well, uh, you know, confirm your sources, uh, multiple, you know, use a couple sources. Oh, OK, <clears throat> then you get out there and you're like, nobody will talk to me. Right. Especially if you're a freelancer and they don't think they need to talk to you because you're not important. I think if you build an audience, you'll find that they will talk to you because you have an audience and 
there's a reason that Prince uh, Harry and Meghan talked to Oprah, right? Because she can get the audience. So there you should see uh, there's the resources. That's a bunch of links. Uh, the gold standard is a, um, a PDF I put together for shooting video. I think there's something there on audio as well. Uh, that's maybe a 15 minute read, but I talk about framing. And then the other thing I'm going to, I promised you, I'm going to put a link for um, how to shoot a sequence. <clears throat> and then we're going to take a break. And um, and Gary, while you are doing the link, I would like to highlight two opportunities for journalists. And you can see this on our conference website uh, on the agenda day three and four. We have uh, memberships for SEJ, the Society of Environmental Journalists. It's a complimentary one year membership for being part of the conference. So if you like to take a, a take the opportunity, you can definitely become a member for one year uh, without um, any fees. And that's the one offer. And the other one I like to bring to your attention is uh, small grants proposals. We have specific grants coming up for journalists, for civil society organizations, and you can apply. There are gonna be links that are coming up. So keep your eye on, the, on our website. I'll, give you a visual here. So when you go to our website and you click on the agenda for day three and day four, the same, on the top, we have highlighted these opportunities for you. So the Society for Environmental Journalist membership is highlighted here on the top. And then the call for small grants proposals, you can see all the information that is available right there. And then um, some links will be coming as we get them so you can get some more access. But this is something that you can definitely take advantage of just by the sheer fact that you are here and you've been interested. So I wanted to make sure that you do know about these and you do have access to them. So let's just finish. We're just gonna finish up. I wanna give you some kind of resources. Uh, I wanna to talk to you specifically about uh, data journalism um and again some of the ethics behind that uh let's again forgive the half baked uh not being able to see full screen but uh, i think you can get the idea of it uh basically uh, uh we're going to look at uh, presentation and uh, visualization of oops data that's not what i wanted to do uh you'll see that in a second and let me move this over here uh, i i think the thing with data journalism that's really interesting is that um it's a, it's, it, is, it isn't just numbers, like people say, oh, well, is it just facts and figures? Um, there's an article that I've given you a link to uh, by Rebecca McBride, it's quite a good one. And she says that uh, data journalism, it's stories, uh, stories are just, um, it's been said that stories are just data with soul, but contextualizing data in order to form a meaningful story provides many unique challenges. At its core, the mission to find meaning in data can be labeled as data journalism, uh, but it's it's a hard term to define. So from a technical standpoint, <clears throat> data journalism, let me actually stop sharing so you can see me. Uh, data journalism um, is defined as um, obtaining, cleaning, and analyzing data for use in storytelling. But on a larger level, um, it's a great way to uh, bring voices to the front, to the forefront, so people can see. It will help you understand certain uh, state of affairs in the world, and it'll also help you uh, look at uh, some uh, systematic issues uh, and showcase what's going on. Um, but it also can perpetuate stereotypes and give you problems with uh, systematic issues. Um, Ethics are part of journalism, and part of that is also the technology that we use. So that's why I wanted to spend a few minutes to say, look, if you light somebody wrong, right, or uh, we, uh, Darsh and I were just talking about bad sound. If you can't hear somebody properly, uh, these are things that actually play into it. So uh, let's say my quote, you can hardly hear because it's badly mic'd and the, it's too dark, but the other person, you can hear them clearly. That That is not fair journalism, and that's a technical problem. Um, and so in the past, we used to have a camera operator, an audio person, a producer, and a, and a reporter, so people could specialize. But now it's not so much, right? It's, um, 
it's you you have to do everything and oftentimes you're the one that has to build the project like you're editing it or you're 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 okay in the past you write the story but now you got to do more technical things maybe you're doing a podcast and you have to sort of ask yourself too you know what headlines do you use there was a question about that earlier because the headline can slant the story one way or the other um there was a story in toronto newspapers we uh, have a hockey team the toronto maple leafs and the uh, during one of the uh, playoffs games, the the captain uh, got um, badly hurt. He was he was uh, hit and he fell backwards and I don't know. Anyways, bad concussion. And there was a newspaper that had the headline uh, the next day: "Captain Crunched." And there was a picture of him lying on the ice, and the, you know, a play on the serial Captain Crunch. Uh, there was a lot of negative pushback from the, uh, the, the the hockey club because they're like that didn't seem fair. It seemed unbalanced, and they really didn't like what the Sun had, the, the the newspaper had said about that. Um, but it was a it was a catchy headline, right? Somebody thought it was it was interesting. But you are responsible for the stuff that you put out there, and um, and you also the other thing with data journalism is you want to make sure you display it in such a way the way you present it is that that people uh, it's clear and easily understood, right? Uh, the problem is if you don't do that, um, uh, it's very easy to, again, to um, to lose your story. Like you've spent all this time digging out, you get all these sources and then nobody reads it because it's just not interesting or it's really uh, clunky. Um, I read an article about how to make your story more readable. And it says the longer your sentences are, the less your readers will understand, especially if it's about data and information and facts. So according to the information that I found, there's an American Press Institute. Uh, when the average sentence length is fewer than eight words, uh, readers understood 100% of the story. Eight words or less, 100%. Uh, by 14 words, uh, comprehension, about 90%. Uh, they could comprehend about, uh, comprehend about 90% of the information. If you move to a 43-word sentence, uh, comprehension moved below 10%. So sometimes stories, uh, especially if you're writing for the newspaper, really long run on sentences and the stories can get lost in that. And that really does play into the fact that um, it's better to keep short sentences, keep things concise. Um, and especially if you're doing a television story, shorter is better. If you're doing an audio story, short uh, story, same thing. Um, and if your story, so again, if it's not presented interestingly, um, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's not great. One of the uh, things in the resources, there's a, um, uh, data journalism.com, uh, newsletters, bad charts. You can look at that on your own time. Uh, people trust charts and maps, right? But sometimes they're not done right. Or they're confusing. They're very confusing. A good chart is excellent. A bad chart is horrible. So take a look at that. And again, remember data is not just, just isn't numbers, right? There's, there's always a human story behind that. So, uh, maybe the best way to tell a story about data, uh, you know, um, I don't know, you're talking about a figure or something to do with the extractive industry. How does that affect the, the, uh, impact the community or what does that look like? Maybe help people visualize how many gallons, like what does is, what is 100,000 gallons look like? Um, and don't forget the human element either, right? Every, every data point is a person. Uh, even today when we looked at the, the poll that we did for, uh, that we did yesterday, um, every vote is a person, right? Six of you believe this, you know, and four of you believe that. And that's the lived reality that we're living with, right? So um, you have to ask yourself, what visuals do I need to tell the story? If you're doing a photograph, is the photograph reflective uh, of, of what you're trying to tell? And uh, are your graphs, anything that you use, are they clear and fair? And um, does your language, the words you use, does it, does it reflect the, uh, the confidence in your, in your data and analysis? And again, transparency is important too. If, if, you, don't, if you question the data, um, you know, first of all, don't rush to publish it. See if you can get um, more information on them. And if you're really not sure, then it's better. I would say it's better to... Um, not run something you just don't believe, right? If you think it's fake or, um, you know, uh, you might be pushed by other agencies or other people might be putting stuff up. But uh, remember that uh, once it's out there, it's out there. And once it's out there with your name on it, it's on there forever with your name on it. Um, and you want to make sure that um, uh, 
uh, you know, the stuff that you're publishing is relevant, right? Um, and and so in our in our um, uh, you know the point number two here is the the um, so we talk about publishing it, um, but the other part of the to uh, the table is the um, uh, it's understanding the uh, publication methods and audiences. So it's not so how are you going to present and visualize the data? Is that clear? And then that also relates to the second point: where are you going to um, uh, publish it or publish it and and what's your audience right is it a younger audience is it an older audience um are you putting it on a social media platform so then remember i was saying when you're shooting your video you should be shooting this way but maybe if you're doing social media you want to do some stuff vertically right so that's something else that you have to keep in mind um and how much of the data should you publish like how much of this is relevant and maybe only certain things are relevant and um the other thing is when you publish stuff, we live in a world where people will fact check what you're saying, especially if they don't agree with you. The question was asked about activist journalism and can they, um, okay, with activist journalism, what happens with that? Well, the, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to promote a certain side to the story, uh, but there's going to be people on the other side of that story. They're going to kind of push back against you. And you need to be ready for that. That's why you need to really have your facts in order and have sources that can stand their ground. And um, it's, it's you know, people will trust you because uh, they followed you for years and they know you're a fair person. And uh, you really wanna maintain a reputation for, for accurate reporting and, and your handling of facts. And again, for um, I wouldn't put my stamp of approval on anything I don't really, um, believe in um and again to you know um you you will make mistakes but that's okay uh that's part of the part of the uh the struggle uh is uh you know uh the sign of an ethical journalist is is to maybe lose a few nights sleep because you're like you know maybe i shouldn't have done that or maybe i wasn't fair to that particular government uh agency or whatever and just because there's a government agency it doesn't mean that they're bad like like there's good people that work in government too right so it's not like us versus them um but it's uh i think what you're going to find is that over time um you will uh you know you'll get an audience that trusts you because you you know and maybe you don't get all the good interviews maybe the government won't talk to you but maybe that's why they like you because you are a definite outsider. And I think everybody knows if, if certain agencies are always, you know, front and center and, and just being that mouthpiece for the government, I think they will lose credibility over time. And over time, they'll lose the audience because people don't want to hear what the government's saying. They want to hear what somebody who's neutral says, right? And so when you're going to publish, um, you're going to ask, like, what are you going to publish? What have you decided to put out there? And uh, you're going to let your audience know um, what's what you did to to verify the material that you're you're giving them. What's and again, too, if you don't have time in that article, maybe make it as a side, uh, like a sidebar or or somewhere else. Uh, there was one uh, website I was looking at where there was, there was like a verification button. You clicked on it, and it showed like a kind of like a, a biography, a bibliography of like sources and where things came from, and where they got the quotes, and um, you know, the other thing is, uh, who does uh, who does the the data belong to, right? Is it is it public data? Is it put out by a by a particular company? Do they own the data, right? So um, that's part of it as well. Like um, people will understand an inherent bias if, let's say, a uh, statistic came out and said that smoking is not bad for you but it was put out by the American, I don't know, cigarette companies, right? Okay, maybe it's a little bias, right? It's like with sugar. I was watching a documentary on sugar and they were talking about, uh, you know, how they said, oh, sugar is good for you, you know, better than aspartame. And, and, and who's behind these companies? It's the sugar companies because they want you to buy their product, right? Um, and so the third point is really responsibly managing and analyzing data. And um, just check the veracity of it. Make sure that it's uh, what you're providing there's your readers is something that's independent, it's impartial, and it's reliable. 
And the other thing too, to the point about the government won't confirm something or they won't talk to us, um, that isn't always a bad thing because what they say may not actually, it might just be kind of government speak anyways. Like it, it might be, if you ever listen to the government speak, they often don't answer the question. Uh, as a journalist, when you're interviewing somebody, you should ask one question at a time. Uh, what I found is if you ask two questions, they'll pick the easier question and ignore the other one. Uh, and the other thing I've seen many, many times is you ask a question and they don't answer it anyways. They just go back and say the line like, you know, um, uh, let's say you say, what color is the sky? And they say, well, it's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. Yeah, what color is the sky? Another beautiful day tomorrow. They just won't ever answer the question. Um, and that, by the way, is true for uh, in, in, in Canada, in the United States, any company, in Britain, anywhere that's open. Uh, politicians play the same game. They know what they want you to say. They give you a really short soundbite. And, um, you know, I, I think having outside experts is the way to go, especially if there's something that can be proven or if you have experts that deal with oil and gas. Oh, the other thing I was going to tell you, too, there's a, a Corsa or Corsera. It's called a C O U R S. ERA offers a bunch of free courses and they had some, I looked up, they had some on the oil and gas industry. What I would do is I would educate myself on the actual business a bit more. So I had a bit more like understand what fracking is or whatever you're looking into and understand some of the technical side of things. Uh, maybe take a course, do stuff online. There's lots of stuff online. Do you need to go to school for this? Do you need a certificate on your wall? But no, it's sort of like those of you that own cars. If you don't know anything about your car, you'll get ripped off. If you know some knowledge, you'll say, well, I already, you know, my aunt took her car and they would try to get her to do a bunch of stuff. She just, she said, I just had the uh, rad flush and I just had that done. Right. So um, she knew better because she knew that information. So so try to educate yourself, um, not just about data journalism, but about the subjects that you're, you're looking into so that you become an expert. It's sort of like if you watch, um, you know, news shows, there's a medical expert who's usually a physician. You know, I teach at a J school and I often tell students like, do your journalism degree as an undergraduate degree. And by the way, the question was, are journalism, do journalism schools matter? And I would say yes. And I thought of another point. It gives you a few years to make mistakes so you can, and people will correct your mistakes and not fire you. Because the problem is in some businesses, uh, I mean, I heard stories where people make one mistake and they're fired and that's it for your career basically. Whereas at J school, you can do four years and try stuff and make mistakes and come back and okay, you got an F on that assignment, but at least you didn't lose your job. Um, and so you can kind of learn as you go. But um, but this is the thing with, uh, with, 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 with data journalism, is um, sometimes I'm terrible at math. So any of the numbers I have a harder time with, um, pick what you're good at, right? Um, but again, so what I tell graduates is now, if you, if you want to be a business reporter, now go do an MBA, right? Go get a, 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 like an actual degree in the field that you're studying. I want to be a medical person. Okay, well, go get a, some kind of medical degree. Well, knock everything over. Uh, go get some kind of medical degree. Um. And again, this is where collaboration comes in. Maybe your data processing skills aren't very good and you can talk to other people. Um, and sometimes the stuff is just too much. Let's say you give you a whole bunch of information and you can't check all of it. Just check part of it. Do like a little sample like of different parts to see if what they're saying is true. Um, when I travel, kind of I use like a cup of coffee as the bellwether. If there's a place that's a co uh, coffee, $8, that's probably an expensive store, right? Because uh, I know what... I would pay for coffee. I know what the price of a coffee is in my country. So I use that to, um, to say, okay, well, I'll go across the street because this is, I've walked into a store that clearly is too expensive. And so what I would do is just do like little tests of things. Okay. Well, these, these facts I know, or I know I can test these out. And then, um, uh, you, if, if they seem like every, every sample is, is accurate, then you're probably all right. You know? Uh, but look for the hidden facts, too, or stuff that's kind of buried at the bottom. Um, oftentimes, uh, governments, in order to hide stuff, they'll just give you a ton of stuff, and there's too much stuff, and stuff's lost in the, in, in the 40 boxes they sent you. Um, and so you want to be a digger, right? You're, you're going to be a, 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 like a journalist that's like an archaeologist. You're, you're sifting through the sand, as it were. Um, and again, to the idea of transparency, it's just about facts checking, verifying your sources, using reliable sources, if you can, right? Um, uh, and then too, like, what about some reliable sources? What about like, um, there's a bunch of like 
government agencies like the UN or uh, World Health Organization, Eurostat, there's the World Bank. Uh, what about places like that? Are they reliable? Remember that some information is presented to the best of their knowledge. It doesn't mean that it's super accurate. It's mostly an estimate in some cases. So be aware of that just because it's uh, it's the World Bank or whoever doesn't mean it's it's dead on accurate. And again, you should check everything. Um, I remember something in J school, something about, you know, don't even believe what your mother says. If, if Oh, something like if your mother tells you she loves you, make sure you, you know, fact check that or something. Get two sources for that, right? Um, surveys can be helpful, right? I think the survey we did yesterday is kind of gives us a nice place to start. Surveys are, are they super accurate? Depends on the number, right? Uh, it's all about the sample size. Who did the survey? How did they do the survey? There was a very famous story. I don't know. It was uh, one of the American elections. Was it Nixon and somebody else? They did a bunch of surveys and they thought Nixon was going to lose. Um, but then Nixon won by a landslide. And the reason was that when they were doing the polling, they used the phone. They were phoning people to get a uh, survey answer. And at the time, I guess the people that were voting for Nixon didn't have phones, right? I guess it was, uh, it was about uh, economics. And so they voted and he won by a long side. Was it Dewey and Truman? I don't know. I don't follow American elections, but something like that. But, but the, the, um, how the poll is being conducted makes a difference. Um, and then um, live data, right? Stuff that's, you know, like say election results. Um, I work in Canada with the media cons uh, consortium. And what it is, it's a bunch of media outlets, news agencies, and we all band together. And so rather than have different companies or different agencies at uh, cover the elections, everybody gets the results at the same time. And it's, it's very careful. We deal with the polling officers and they deal with their people. Those numbers come in and there's lots of double like um, uh, uh, things built in. So the things are double checked and that the numbers are accurate. If there's any discrepancies, they're quickly found. Uh, but it's a shared, it's a shared resource. Everybody's like, yeah, we'll put in. So everybody puts in money to have this media consortium and it becomes much fairer and, um, and I think more accurate too, right? Um, and so you're sharing the cost of the technical setup, but you're also sharing the results, um, which is nice, right? So I guess that's the thing too with teaming up with people. If you can some way find uh, others to work with on certain things, Again, like the Snowden story, there's just too much information. So you have a couple different agencies saying, okay, we'll take this, you take that. And we just sort of work together, realizing for the good of journalists, it isn't sometimes about your bottom line, maybe the other person sells more newspapers, but overall it's good for um, verification and, and veracity, right? And people, um, you know, saying, yeah, I, I believe I'm going to go to, I'm going to turn on a news agency and, uh, and watch because, um, it's, um, I know it's, it's, it's reliable, right? Um, I know we're running short on time. I'm just gonna, just a couple other quick things I wanna sort of go through. Actually, I'll just share the, my, my uh, PowerPoint at the end so we can just finish that off um, here. And then if there's any questions, we'll take those before we end. Uh, let's do this, I'm gonna jump ahead. So for, part, uh, for our table, let's jump down to the end. Uh, let's see, we talk about the last point is just examining sources and cross-checking uh, data sources. Um, uh, a lot of journalism isn't sexy. It's, uh, it's sitting, it's making phone calls, it's digging stuff up, it's looking at stuff, it's examining, is it, um, uh, you know, is, is what I'm being told uh, reliable? Um, and the thing is, don't uh, it's about just, again, I, I guess the thing I can't speak enough to is the, about your reputation, your reputation. It's you, um, your name's on the byline. Um, and if you don't think, you know, it's, it's true, then don't say it. Don't get pushed into it by your editor. Don't get pushed into it because you need to buy groceries. And if you feel that, like if you're always in a place where you're compromised because you just can't afford to be a journalist, but you still want to be a journalist, then uh, as terrible as it sounds like, take a part-time job so that, okay, I know I have, at least have a steady income and I'm going to do the stories that I want to do. And I'm also going to be afraid of, uh, I'm not going to be afraid of, um, you know, if, if, if the story doesn't sell, I'm still okay, right? Um, and 
yeah, I just, uh, I mean, the, the final thing really, there's a whole bunch of resources. I've, I've put the PDF there. There's all kinds of, there's some handbooks you can look at for verification. I do want to just mention three apps that I put down there for actually four. Uh, there's the Night Lab Story Map, uh, which is, uh, I love story maps. Uh, it's a great way to, show, to put some data. Uh, let's see, well, here, well, you can look them up. You can hit the links, we're short on time. But I put links, there's a story map, there's a timeline JS. These are free resources that you can use that um, can put a story in a timeline. If you're doing that, uh, maybe you're putting a bunch of dates on like a, a project or something, you can do that. Uh, we also use Google Maps as a good way. You can do um, some stuff through Google Maps. Story Sphere is an interesting way to do a 360 story. Uh, you can look at that, that's another thing. Uh, Canva is also something that we've used uh, with some success. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of reference guides and they're pretty easy reading some of these things. Uh, guide to bulletproofing your data, verification. Uh, there's a great article on ethics there as well. And uh, I wanna show you last point because I have the tab open still. And it's about um, uh, information is beautiful, right? I'm just gonna show you that. If you can um, make your stuff beautiful, right? Like I think what you're gonna find is that people pr appreciate the work put into breaking down the numbers. So here's your COVID cases, right? These are the top cases. These are the deaths, right? And these are the vaccinations. And again, two, when you're reading the data, so you think, oh, look at this, 40, 63% of Canada has been vaccinated, but those of us that live here realize that's only one shot, not two. Israel leads, leads with two shots, 57%. Um, but um, isn't it beautiful? Like, like it's so nice. Google Maps, uh, you know, places like you can see all the numbers and then you can use color coding if you're graphically inclined. Um, this is a lovely place to, I mean, we can do some comparison here. Right, um, but but you think, oh, look at look at we are. People love this kind of stuff because we're very very visual, right? Very visual. Look at this. These are high risk things. Nightclub, low risk. Isn't that easy? Look at that, right? This is really quite interesting, right? Um, and all of these things, I think you're going to find uh, if it's interesting, people will read your material. They'll watch your stuff. Try to tell your story through people if you can. Don't just talk about numbers and figures and data. Talk about how that affects and impacts people's lives. That's what I would do uh, if you can. Try to find a story who's impacted, a person who's impacted by the number that you're reading. Uh, and, and, and people, I think people respond more to people than a number on a page, right? Because it's just a fact or figure. Kitty, do we have any more questions? Uh, we got about eight minutes left, seven minutes, and I don't. Uh, there's, maybe you want to talk about the. Uh, so there's the feedback form. What else have we got there? Advantages. Yes, yeah, so we do have the SCG membership, the Society for Environmental Journalists. It's a complimentary one-year membership. So go ahead and definitely take advantage of it. And also, if you want to, please go ahead and apply for the small grants. Propo you can write your proposal. It is for journalists, and uh, it would probably support you in your next endeavor. And there's a question about the resources that Gary, you have put in uh, the chat. Some people had a hard time with it. So uh, the organizing team will, will recoup after this, this workshop and see if we can email them out as attachments to you. Hopefully we can do that logistically and so that you wouldn't miss out on anything that Dr. Gould has shared with you throughout today. And just to give you a visual, I do want to show you the information that uh, is about the membership and the the small grants. So if you go to the conferences website and the agenda page, and for today and tomorrow, both pages right on the top of the page, you can see the details about the Society of Environmental Journalist membership and also the call for proposals for small grants. And it's both for civil society organizations and for journalists. So we are welcome all your submissions. Hopefully this will help you fund uh, some of your 
work that is ahead of you. And right here on the menu, you can see that the transparency portal is one of the items and it has very, very helpful tools and resources for you. It is filled with links, all kinds of different organizations and their website, uh, anything that you need to know about mining, energy, forestry, they are nicely categorized. So based on what you are looking for, you can definitely find some resources here or at least a direction that it would point you into to gather some more information. So please go ahead and take a look. We have been updating this list with all of our speakers throughout the conference. So anything that we can get our hands on, we make that available to you so you can take, uh, you can use that and you can benefit from it. And again, it is on the conference website under transparency portal. And you can see everything that we have here. And then lastly, the survey that Gary has mentioned is another item on our website. You can definitely take the survey. It is designed to gather the perceptions of the public in and about transparency in the extractive sector in Guyana. And as you take the survey, we have more and more responses. So please do go ahead and, and fill out the survey. I'm gonna put that link in the chat right away so you are not missing it. And you can also see on the same page, if you click on view survey results, then it is dynamic and it's real time. So you can see just like Gary demonstrated it for you, that these numbers are changing as more and more people complete them. And there are some real pointed questions after you know the demographics. There are some real pointed questions about how people feel about transparency from all kinds of angles. So we welcome your opinion and your perspective. And also you can go ahead and share this with your network because we would like to hear as many voices as we can. We have 21 responses so far. So we are really far from having all of our participants complete. We have about over 200 participants by today. So we really, really encourage you to go ahead, complete the survey and check on the results time to time and see what is the general perception. Um, and this is all the information I wanted to share with you. And please do not leave without completing the feedback survey. We are eager to hear how was this workshop for you? How helpful, what is that you learned? What are things we can improve upon maybe for next time? And it is just really a great honor to have Dr. Gary Gould here with us for this long period of time in this afternoon and share his experience, his tips, and tricks and tools and enlighten us on many of the different aspects when it comes to reporting and how to be ethical and follow all the guidelines to be, to be and remain credible as a source of information for your country. And with that, I'd like to give this over to Reina for you for a bit if you'd like to close it out. Yes, I'll be happy to do so. First of all, I, I, I really thank everyone for participating in this event. I, I'm hoping that you all walk away with something that you can use on your day-to-day -day job or you can use to communicate to the broader public about the importance of uh, the extractive sector transparency and good governance. Dr. Gary Gould, it's been a real pleasure to have you uh, conduct this workshop. It's been exciting, informative, and uh, we are absolutely thrilled. So thank, thank you, you very much, participants. Thank you very much, Dr. Gary Gould. And thank you to the wonderful people behind the scenes who I often don't get a chance to thank. They've been very busy working. Um, uh, Mr. D D Kitty, Mr. Chan, Wynette, Stacia, and team. So thanks again. And I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you. And please join us tomorrow for more exciting events. We are still going strong till Friday. So thank, thank you. you very much. And, and Raina, if I can just say too, if anybody wants to email me, just ggould at ryerson.ca, I'm happy to take your emails. Oh, thank you, Gary. I'm sure everybody will be emailing you real soon. Appreciate it. <laughs> and, thank and you, everybody. I look forward to having thank Gary come you. back for some uh, other workshops in the next uh, coming months. So uh, look forward to it. We'll keep you all informed. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raina. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty. Thanks, Gary. Good to see you again. Great to see you. We'll talk again. Yeah, thank you. And talking about tomorrow, the journalist and journalism students, the afternoon is dedicated for you again. 
we have a webinar from the Society of Environmental Journalists. It starts at 1.30 on the afternoon. And then right after that at 2.30, we have a very special private discussion just for you Guyanese journalists. And uh, it is with the panelists and the speakers from the workshop. But that webinar will have over 100 participants. So that's not really a forum for you to chat one on one with these great uh, experts in the field. So we have a closed session for you. And if you want the link to join, please put your name in the chat and we get it to you right away. There's no registration needed for that. It is private for the Guyanese journalists. And then the afternoon at 3.30, we will open up the the whole conference again for the whole public. And uh, we have documentaries that we want to share with you. And for some, we have the people who created them as conversation partners, just to give you a little bit of behind the scene look at how the production was going. So that's what's scheduled for tomorrow. The afternoon is definitely dedicated to you journalists. And then on Friday, we are closing out the conference with two really great presentations, one from the Guyana Gold Board and one from uh, about extractivism and intergenerational justice in Guyana. And then we close out with the closing ceremony at 11.30 a.m. So, all Guyana time. So we are eager to see you back tomorrow. If you need the link again for the private discussion for only Guyanese journalists with the SEJ experts and speakers, please put your name in the chat so we can make sure that you have it. And with that, thank you so much. We hope to see you very soon.